Good evening. Time to get started. Daniel asked me if I was ready, and I said, don't I look like it? <laughs> it has been one long month, I will say that. So please forgive me for that. So we're going to talk about when we all share the load, and some things I'd like for you to think about is sharing a load. And uh, if you look at something as simple as this building and where it's standing and how the load-bearing parts of this building have to work properly for this building to stand and to be supported the, the proper way. And without those proper supports, this building would collapse, and which has happened. And I mean, we just had a pedestrian crosswalk collapse in Florida the other day and killed a bunch of people. And some other things, it was not engineered correctly or whatever, and, and things do fall down and the load bearing was not there. So we can see that as we pick up the load and try to carry it, we need to make sure that we're able to do that. We have the ability to do that and uh, are willing to do that. So many people are not willing to bear any of the load in the Christian society, and they only want a few to do that. And, uh, and then it causes problems. Um, when we all share the load, uh, what is the load? What is the load that Christians share? Christianity is uh, one of those things. I was asked the other day, you mean if I become a Christian, I have to teach people about Christ? And I said, well, yeah, that's kind of uh, behind that. And I was told, so I don't mind becoming a Christian, but I really don't want to do the other part. Well, you can't be a Christian without doing the other part because you're not really a Christian unless people know you're a Christian. And once they know you're a Christian, then the other parts will fall in place. You know, and uh, the load is just a burden or a load is what that word means in the Greek. Such as a ship that's laden with cargo and that ship has to be able to withstand the weight of that cargo and all the things that it hauls to be able to keep from sinking and uh, losing all their money, I guess. And such as a team of horses pulling a load. You have to have the right amount of horses to pull a load, and they have to be properly trained. And that's one of the problems in the Lord's Church sometimes. We're not properly trained. We're not prepared for what's coming at us. And it is difficult. I remember when I was a young man that my grandfather told me about his horses. He loved horses. He was worked with horses, could never transition over to tractors, and he worked with horses all of his life. He tried a couple of times and went back to the horses. So the teams of horses was granddad's a big thing. And he had one horse when he was younger that was named Duke, and he used him to train all the other younger horses to pull their share and to do what they wanted to do. And I said, well, how did that work, granddad? And he said, well, he said, well, Duke was pretty good. He said, if the other horse wasn't pulling his leg, he'd start kicking him a few times. And uh, it wasn't too long until the other horse decided it would pull its load. And that's the problem with Christians. We can't kick each other, of course, but the theory is there about the proper training and pulling the load because the load is heavy at times. And when only a few carry that load, it is very difficult and it does not work the way it should be and how it could be. And we all have a lot of other things we're dealing with. We have jobs, we have, some have school, some have marriage, children, health, and just being a Christian is a load at times and sometimes a greater load than others and uh, all the things going on. And so we need to understand that when we pull together and we build together and we hold up that load as Christianity, we'll be able to accomplish great things. Without that, we will not, and we will fail miserably. And we need to understand that. I remember one congregation that uh, Linda and I attended years ago. It was a congregation of 120 people and growing. And I'll never forget a gospel preacher came in and he said, you have things going well here. Don't let Satan in. They're lucky if they have 30 today. Wise words from a gospel preacher that were never heeded. From the infighting and the squabbling and all the other things that were going on, the load bearing went away and the Christianity collapsed. And the other congregations which you and I know of where Satan has got in there and has caused the load bearing pieces to fall apart 
and then the church spiritually falls apart. And we need to understand that as we live our lives and as we do what we're going to do as Christians, that we try to up, uh, lift each other and build each other up in the most holy faith. And it's hard. We all have things that we have to deal with in life. Sometimes more of a burden than others, right? Sometimes it might be the job. Sometimes it might be the marriage. Sometimes it might be the children or our health or just being a Christian in general. And we all have to deal with that. But at the same time, we can't expect the same horse to pull the load all the time, or you won't have a load to be moved very far. And Satan is very good at what he does and how he does it. And uh, you remember King Rehoboam, uh, when he became king after Solomon, and his great wisdom, this man was 43, year old, 43 years old when he became king. He was not a young man. He should have been somebody that had more uh, leadership ability than what he had. And because of the sins of Solomon, we know that God let that kingdom fall apart. The load-bearing pieces fell apart. And you remember Jeroboam and the people came to him and said, Your father was cruel to us and he taxed us greatly. Just ease our burdensome and we'll follow you anywhere. And you remember he went and talked to the old man, old men, and he said, Listen to the uh, people who are telling you right. And he went and listened to the young men. They said, no, make their burdens worse than what they are. And, uh, and pile more on top of them. And this is what he said, Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. In First Kings, the 12th chapter and verse 11. And that's the way we are sometimes in the Lord's church. Because we have to deal with the same thing the world does with the jealousy, the envy, and all the other things that are there that cause us problems. And just as Rehoboam made a large mistake here, we can do the same thing. And the congregation can either grow and be built up, or it can be torn down. And we need to understand that as we go through with this. And you'll notice that the Pharisees added to the load also of people trying to do what was right. The Pharisees uh, were one of the two ruling parties at the time of Jesus. The Pharisees and Sadducees. And then you had the Zealots and the Scribes and some of the others. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were probably your greater two. But over in Matthew 23, 25 through 26, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. And sometimes, I hate to say it, but I've seen it too many times over the years that we have too many people that are like the Pharisees. They put on a good pretense, and they're just as rotten to the core as the Pharisees were. And uh, Christians, because you occupy a pew does not mean you're going to heaven. Or me either one. And the next one about the Pharisees in Matthew 5 and 20 says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no means enter the kingdom of heaven. These were the people that stood on the street corners and recited prayers that they had memorized just for a big show. And they would memorize verses and they would put them on flactories, little rolled up scrolls, and they would put them on their breastplates all these uh, amounts of scriptures that they had memorized. Many things with them were just for show. And they were the spiritual leaders, the ones that were holding up the Jewish religion at the time Jesus came back. And the support there was not there. And they were something that were hypocrites. And they tried to uh, do one thing and say another. And we've got to be very careful with that ourselves. And then the last one, Matthew 23 and 4, says they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. You see, sometimes uh, we're pretty quick about uh, adding criticism to other people and what they should do and how they should do it, but ourselves, we do not touch that, have anything to do with it, and we're just stepping back with a poker and a fire, keep stoking it so it keeps burning, right? 
And uh, remember, Satan is good at what he does and how he does it. He doesn't want us to get along. He doesn't want us to be uplifted. He doesn't want us to share in the loot. He wants us to fight and squabble and point fingers at each other and all the other things we have to do in this world because of Satan's influence that causes the congregation to sputter and not grow as it should. We have a gospel meeting coming up with Brother Luther Pratt, 15th through the 20th. And are we going to build that up? Are we going to tear it down? Or what are we going to do to make it a success? And how are we going to make that happen? He is a, a good man. He's coming a long way. He's come up here to hold that meeting with us from South Carolina. So we need to support him in that effort as much as we possibly can and do the best we can with that. And be the supports, be the pillars that holds up the church and the ones that are going to put forth the light that others might see our good works and glorify God which is in heaven. And you say, well, Harold, I don't know about you, but I said, I about have all I can handle. And I really don't want any more to do right now. And I, I want you to sometime go back and read Numbers 11. <coughs> I want you to get back and read Numbers 11. I'm going to touch on two verses only from that chapter. It's about Moses. And it's about the people of Israel. And Moses was at his wit's end. Because nothing he could do was right. Nothing he could give them was good enough. And no matter what he said, it was the wrong thing or the wrong way. And he's down. And he needs somebody to lift him up. And that account there. You read Numbers 11 sometime and see Moses. And he had all he could handle. He had between one and a half and two million people by himself to try to lead through the wilderness until this time. So you got problems? You got problems. I was talking to, I'll share this story with you. I was talking to one of my employees. A few weeks ago and I said well we didn't have such a good day we had kind of a bad day he was in a different part of the state he said you think you had a bad day let me tell you about my day and I proceeded to hear about 10 minutes of how bad his day was and it was it was bad I got to give him credit but you see sometimes we think that our days are bad and other people's are not we all have things we have to deal with right but Moses he's having a really bad time here the people were giving him all kinds of problems and fits. I don't know how he withstood it. I'm going to tell you straight up. I don't know how Moses withstood it. He said he was the humblest of all men, and he must have been. Because the first one comes from Numbers 11, 14. He says, I'm not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And then he goes on to talk in this conversation with God. And he said, well, there's 70 elders of the children of Israel. We'll use them and we'll share that load for you. And in verse 17, he says, well, I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them and they will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. You see, when we have a work day, how many people shows up? When we have some other kind of day where we... The Bible study, Friday night. How many people are planning to be there? Or how many people already know they're not going to be there? Think about that. See, we don't... This is huge. It's not a last-minute thing. It's something we plan ahead of time. Bible study is not a real big thing for me. And uh, I don't really have time for it. And i got other things i got to do. And all these things, and we've been announcing about this Bible study for several weeks now. And I guess the question for you is, and for everybody is, to be a pillar, how are you going to lift up what's here and what's not here, and how are we going to support this weight if we can't come to such a thing as a simple Bible study and support each other in that? And Christians is another thing that they need to, we need to share and load with, living the way that we should. It is not easy to be a Christian. People are going to look for reasons to attack you and to hate you and all the other things that's going to happen in this life because they really don't want to be around you because you're a light in a dark world and they don't want to see that light. 
Over in John 15 and 18, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. You see, the way we live our life, how we do the things we do, what priorities we put where, and how we put them there, what we're going to do, are we going to grow spiritually, we're going to fall back spiritually, we're going to lift each other up, we're going to tear each other down, we're going to let Satan say, well, brother so-and-so, he does that all the time, drives me nuts. And I'm going to go talk to Ed about brother so-and-so, I'm going to go talk to brother Donnie about brother so-and-so, and I'm never going to go talk to brother so-and-so. I hate to have to tell you, but that is gossip. In the next one, in Second Timothy 3 and 12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so many people, we have problems with that because we think that godly people never have problems farthest thing from the truth. We all have problems and we all have to deal with those problems and the things in our lives that are going on um, to trying to be a Christian and doing all the things we need to do for God is very difficult at times, isn't it? Then the last one on that point, and it comes from John 17, 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I'm not of the world. You can't dance that fine line between the world and Christianity and hope you fall the right way in Judgment Day. It won't happen. So as we get into all these things about supporting the church and being pillars and ground of the church and building on that foundation which was laid as Jesus Christ. What are we doing? You know, Daniel had a pretty good article about Caleb this morning and how old he was when he took the mountain. And uh, that's great that a man of that age would have the strength that he had. But you see, there's many things that we can do as young people, as middle-aged people, as senior citizens, there's a lot of things we can do for the influence of Christ. So we need to think about that. When will there be a load? And that's when there's sin. Sin seems to cause a lot of problems in this world, doesn't it? Whether it be my sin or your sin or somebody else's sin, and we all get to deal with it, right? And over in Galatians, the first or sixth chapter in verses one and two, it says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourselves, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. We seem to have trouble with that, right? Bearing each other's burdens, trying to pick each other up, and trying not to find fault with each other. You know, the best example I can give you that is when you go to work and people talk about other people and all the gossip goes around, and it's easy to be drug into that. We've got to be very careful as Christians not to be drug into that because of that. The same thing goes true for the church, and it runs rampant. And we've got to be oh so cautious with that. And understand that sin causes many, many problems. And uh, all the things goes on. You have an opinion. I have an opinion. We'll leave the opinions where the opinions are, right? And I've seen opinions and people's opinions cause a lot of problems in the Lord's church over the years. And we've got to be very, very careful with that. And financially... We know that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. Money itself, Donnie and I sat in there and counted the money this morning. It didn't do anything to us, did Donnie? Just laid there. It's not the money, it's the love of the money, right? The love of the money. But so many people, money causes a lot of problems. Financially, there's some things in our life that could be better, but some of the bad choices we made on our part, has caused us to be where we're at financially sometimes. 
and we're quick to blame others and other situations and and all the things going on and sometimes things are out of our control sickness and health and all the things that goes along with that medical bills uh, that are exuberant and things like that that nothing you can do about and all the things goes on with that but you see the love of money and the things of this world Daniel touched on that this morning they're going to be gone and every time I think about money I think about a guy that I worked with that was everything about money and tried to save every penny he could get and one of my fellow workers looked at him one day and said hey Petey he said, if you're really worried about taking that money with you, he said, how about giving it to me and I'll write you a check. So, you see, that's the way we are, isn't it? We're not going to take you in it with us. We're going to leave it all behind. In Matthew 16 and 26, it says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So little. It is not millions that we sell our soul for. It is a few moments of pleasure. A few moments of what I want to do and how I want to do it that usually cost us our souls. And we need to understand that. That it's very important that we put our priorities in the right places and not somewhere that they should not be. You know, sickness comes in and around and it seemed like I don't know about you, it seemed like my family done pretty well for years and then they started dying off and it was like dominoes. Very difficult time for all of us, but uh, those things happen, that's life. We're not meant to be here forever. And the people we love and care about, they're gonna die and we're gonna die. And uh, that's gonna happen. So we need to understand that. Some of the sicknesses in this world are caused by what we do and how we live our life. How we have not taken care of ourselves or um, some thing that we participate in that caused our health to deteriorate. And uh, I remember a man was telling my dad one time, he said, I've killed myself. And dad said, what? And he said, yeah, but he said, the way I've, what I've ate in my life and how I've taken care of myself, I've killed myself. And he shortly died thereafter with cancer. You see, in other things, time and chance happen to all people, which we've talked about before. Some things just happen. Some things are hereditary. Some other things are just something that you've been associated with and you're going to die. And I'm going to die. And we need to remember that this is a temporary place. It's not some place that's going to be here for a long time. You're not going to be here for eternity. It's not meant to be here for eternity. I don't know about you, when I look in the mirror, I can see my body's wearing out. You young people haven't had to face that yet. But I can see that. I'm not the way I was 30 years ago. I never will be again. And neither will you, the ones that are older. And this is a temporary place, and that's what's happening. When you talk about Caleb, when he took the mountain at 85 years old and he was in pretty good shape, in better shape than me, there's no doubt about that. And all the things went on. This is a temporary place. But heaven is a permanent place for prepared people. What are you preparing for? What are you going to do? And then the other thing is regret. Sorry that things didn't turn out a different way. Ever heard that? Well, I wish I'd have done this different or that different. I think we all have done that and said that in our lifetime and sometimes the regret gets to the point to where uh, we live in the past and we can't catch up with the future. The problem with the past, it's gone forever and you're not going to change it. Other than if it's some kind of sin you need to repent of, it's, you're not going to change that. It's gone forever. Over in Philippians 4.11 it says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. And we seem to have problems with that, especially in the United States of America. You know, uh, Lydia said to Ken and I yesterday, we were running around getting some stuff for him. And she said, I'm really hungry, Granddad. I'm starving to death. 
And I and Ken asked her, well, from one to ten, what would it be, Lydia? She said, a ten, Dad. And I looked at her real serious and I said, sweetie, you don't know what a ten is and neither do I. We live in the greatest country, one of them on the face of this earth, and we have been blessed. And then the last one on that point, if we have food and covering, or King James Version says raiment, with these we shall be content. And that is from 1 Timothy verse six, chapter 6 and verse 8. The problem is we're not content with what we have. We always got to have something bigger, something better, and all that. And in and of itself, that's not the problem. It's when we let things get to a point where uh, they take over, then that's when we have the problem. And nothing wrong with having a house, a car, whatever. It's what we do and what we put first to get that. And what we teach our children about what that is. Do we teach our children about being load-bearing pillars for the church? Or are they something that's going to let the church fall down as soon as you die? Not as soon as I die. <coughs> are they going to pick up the pieces and going to go on? You know, and... Uh, how do we carry the load anyway? You know, the load we have in life is heavy. The load we have in the church at times is heavy. And something will happen in the church and it will shake it to its foundation. At a local congregation I'm talking about, some sin will be committed and something will happen. I've seen that happen time and time and time again. And people have trouble rising above that because that was one of the so-called pillars that was shaken and all that happened. So we need to understand that. And when there is problems, we need to do, as the psalmist said in 55 and 22, it says, cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Too many times, um, people allow their faith to be crushed by something just because they didn't stand with the Lord. And over in 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, in verses 6 and 7, it says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting your anxiety in the New American Standard Version. The King James Version says, Casting your burdens on Him because He cares for you. We all have burdens. Not a one of us is going to get by without that. You know, we're all going to have that. Uh, Funny thing happened a few years ago. Uh, a lady put down on her job papers that she couldn't handle stress. Well, I hate to have to tell you, but we all have to handle stress. So that didn't go too well, and uh, she later quit. But anyway, uh, we all have stress we have to deal with, and sometimes way more than we want, than how we want to deal with it. And it's going to be there, and we're going to have to deal with it. And over in Psalms 34 and 17, it says, A righteous cry. And the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. David, a man after God's own heart, when he um, made the so-called whopper of sins that he made and returned to God, God forgave him and stuck with him. And the same thing can happen to us. And finally, and Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, He said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Now, with all that being said, are you a burden adder or a burden reliever? Baseball season, it time for relievers, right? So, now which one are you? Do you add to the burdens of the local congregation? Do you add to the burdens of the Lord's church? Or are you a reliever? Somebody gets in there and helps out and picks up the pieces and goes on when things are not going right. Too many times that's uh, not the right. I know Nathan has put together some cards for us to mail out. How many of them cards have been mailed out? Well, I'll give you a challenge. Take five of them, mail them to somebody you know. Be an uplifting person. Be somebody that supports the local church. Be somebody that is in there that can be counted on when it happens. 
If you can't find the strength within you to make it to the Bible study Friday night, well then have a Bible study at your house and invite somebody else. Daniel was trying his best. i got to give him credit. And I thank the world and all of him. And we need to support him and Beth in their efforts. And many times we say, well, it's not up to me. What was it Samuel said? Here am I, send me. Here am I. Where are you at? Where are you at in this whole big picture thing? When the gospel meeting comes, where are we going to be? Um, I know Brother Luther's wife was in a pretty bad automobile accident here not too long ago. And they're dealing with that. Burdens that they didn't want. And a lot of other things that he has to deal with. Daniel's got burdens he deals with. And Beth and all the rest of us, right? But are you going to be an uplifter? Are you going to be that reliever? Or are you just going to be one of those people that stoke the fire and keep it burning? You know, if you're with us and you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian. Because there's no other way you're going to get to heaven than becoming a New Testament Christian. And you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithful unto the end. Without these steps, you're not going to heaven, and neither would I. And even if you do that, then you have to do something. Um, being a Christian is something that takes action. And if you think you're going to become a Christian and never tell anybody that you're a Christian, you'll probably fail miserably. And so will I. So when, all, when we all share the load, the work at Wellsburg will get where it needs to be. When we expect a few to carry the load, then Wellsburg will always struggle. Find it in your heart to be the one that builds up and is a pillar for the church at Wellsburg. For you see, those of ones of us that are older one day will pass away. And who will be the pillars that makes it happen? Are you planning on being a pillar? Are you planning on letting the church fall down? Are you planning on doing something that would be in a benefit for the Lord's church? We are very grateful for your presence. If you're with us, and you have not, uh, you have obeyed the gospel and you have fallen away, and you need to find that strength within you to come back, we afford you that opportunity right now. You see? Because there is no other way to get to heaven. We love you. We pray for you. Pray for us. And we need to share the load. If we don't share the load, the work at Wellsburg will never grow. You feel sorry for yourself? That's what you'll get. I feel sorry for myself, that's what I'll get. Well, you see, there is a better way, and that's when we're like that team of horses pulling together. All right? So, let us stand, and we're going to sing uh, the song that's been a selective encouragement, and if you'd be in any, either case, please come. <clears throat>